Hey everybody, this is Michael T. Bradley. I am here today with sometimes riffer, um, oftentimes writer of the group Quip Tracks, and author of the book Tales of the Incorrigible, a Flummox or Bust, Kevin Bowersox. Kevin, thanks for joining me. Yes, yeah, easy for you to say. So, uh, so I worked with Kevin on the audiobook for Incorrigible. I was the voice, and I asked Kevin to come here with me today and talk a little bit about process and the characters in the story. Thanks for joining me, Kevin. Uh, Thank you for asking me, and thank you very much for doing the audiobook. I'm very, very pleased with that. You did a great job. Thank you. So let's let's talk a little bit about the, you know, I I guess very first of all, we should have you just kind of give a a basic setup of the book so if people aren't familiar with it. Okay. It's set in the far future in an absurd universe very similar to the one we live in. The way I started writing the book, it was just sort of a playground for my mind. I just, it's the book I wanted to read, so I had to write it. It's in the far future, and the discovery of the Flitz Drive has allowed interstellar travel to be feasible. And so hundreds and thousands of different species and races are interacting for the first time. Well, they've been interacting for some time, and they're just starting to get on everybody's nerves right now. That's when the story <laughs> takes place. So they're, they're basically uh, college roommates at this point. Exactly, yes. And and so this is the tale of uh, uh, one one spaceship, one crew in this vast universe. I guess technically, technically two, two crews really uh, play a large part in it. Yes, the titular incorrigible is the ship that everybody is on. That is that we focus on mostly. There's also another ship called the Other Woman that used to belong to the captain of the Incorrigible, Lou Talk Grizzly, but it was bought out from under him by um, his arch friend, rival, Ratner Grote. So they both interact with each other throughout the book. They're both looking for the final treasure of a notorious space pirate. So that's the MacGuffin of the book. And, you know, so they're... Uh, there are a few things there that I'd like to kind of unpack a little bit more. Uh, first of all, you, you said this was the book that you wanted to read. Uh, I And I guess that kind of answers my question here, but I want to ask you this question anyway to see what else you might have to say on it. Was, you, was it your intention to tell this story specifically in a book format seemed the best, or was your intention to become a novelist and this book is where you wanted to start? The book was the best format to do this in. In fact, this whole universe started out as a board game. <laughs> I was making a board game of these characters searching through all these different worlds. We, I was designing a board game, and um, you would travel around uh, through all these different systems, and all the species were different, and they all had different... There, I had what I called the Wheel of Harmony, which was who hated who, and you couldn't keep them on the same ship together, or you'd have an insurrection, and it got very, very complicated and eventually unplayable. And so, so, but I still had, but I created all these different races and characters as I was making the board game, and I wanted to use them in some way, and of course it would be prohibitively expensive to make this into a movie, at least for me, and so the book was the way to go. Makes sense. Are are, are there, do you have further stories that you want to tell in this universe then? Because it sounds as if... Oh, the universe really is is the story that you wanted to tell. Yes, I wanted to make a, an eclectic story that really was sort of an embodiment of of what I appreciate about diversity, and um, that all of the different ways of looking at the world, all of the different ways of interacting with the universe. So it will very it's definitely going to be followed up. I've already started book two. I'm on chapter four, and I've laid yes, out. You, you know, that actually, uh, uh, this isn't in the notes that I gave you, but that was something that I was thinking about, is that a lot of the characters seem very aware that everybody comes from a different culture with a different background, but they don't seem very aware what those backgrounds are. They constantly seem kind of, like, accepting but surprised. And I was wondering if that was by design and what was kind of behind that. Yes, it is, because I think that so few people bother to learn about other people's culture. They learn about the parts they have to tolerate, (laughs) but um, other than that, um, they don't dig any deeper. And I think it's uh, very interesting when you do. It helps explain a lot of things. 
but I don't want to sound like too much of a, a culture person because another big point in the book is that everybody's different. You can divide us up in a billion different ways, and that happens all throughout the book. Everybody's dividing along all these different lines all the way through, but no one person really exemplifies that group that you put them in. They're different in so many ways. For instance, Thrum is uh, his race are fraggarts, and they were created for simply for the purpose of destroying things. But he's a barbarian. He went off away from that group, and so he's very different, and he does not exemplify his group. And that's true of almost all the characters in the book. Yeah, though I it it um, you know I I would be hesitant to call it say a book of outcasts from their society because they do all in some ways exemplify places that they're from and that's actually kind of what i want to uh segue into next because the the thing that pops i think the most about this book are are the characters and so i thought that's kind of the best intro to the book to to talk to people about is is just to kind of go into some of the characters you already mentioned the kind of two main i guess the main antagonists uh uh of the book are are captain Grizzly and captain groat from the two ships i guess let's first listen to a brief (laughs) Uh, a brief audio clip from the audiobook um, uh, in which they interact. Put it on screen, Groat commanded. The view screen, which had silver silhouettes of nude women at each of the lower corners, suddenly filled with an image of the incorrigible. Lou talk Grizzly, Groat muttered mostly to himself. What the hell do you want? Joan shivered and let out a long, slobbery stream of air. Okay, then patch him through. The image of the incorrigible was replaced by Cap'n Grizzly. Hey, Ratner, the image said. Hey, Grizzly, come back to lose more money? He smiled with perfect teeth from under a jet-black pencil-thin mustache. There was a twinkle in his brown eyes. No, I came to win the pink slip to that floating brothel of yours. You hold on to your dreams, Grizzly. Actually, I just happened to be in the area and wanted to talk to you about that log you won off me. Talk. I was just wondering if you wanted to cut your losses. I have a contact from the Galactic Society for the Preservation of Hoaxes who would be willing to buy it. Nice try, Grizzly. No, really. I'm willing to make you a handsome offer. Grote pushed a button and a shaken martini rose up out of the armrest of his captain's chair. He sipped at it licked his lips, then spoke. Go ahead. So, as you can tell, uh, these characters have quite a long history with each other and uh, kind of a rapport built up, but it's not 100% friendly. Kevin, you want to kind of talk about their relationship a little? Oh, I kind of think of them as arch frenemies, that um, they like each other and they can get along. But um, they're all, they will also pull the rug out from each other the first chance they get. They're sort of the friends that are stuck together. Fate keeps pushing back up against each other. And the, the, I mean, psychology has shown that the biggest thing in accepting somebody is how long you spend around them. The more time you spend around somebody, no matter how separate you are, you're going to get along a little better as time goes on. So that's that's what's happened to them. That's what that's the evil dirty trick that the universe has played on them so they're, they're kind of in their own buddy cop movie in some ways next let's talk about the relationship between flathead and Thrum, uh who we'll go into a little bit after uh, after this he's with me Thrum explained i'll be responsible for him yes sir you will the little man said which means you are responsible for making sure that it obeys all of the rules laid out here. He placed a word wad on the counter. Shuttles leave every hour, so you can take all the time you need. If you don't wish to have it confiscated, I suggest you become very familiar with those regulations. Have what confiscated? The word wad? That. The man behind the counter pointed directly at Flathead. Thrum noticed that the man had taken on a tone of greater confidence. In fact, he had a definite condescension about him, due most likely to the four guards that were now standing stiffly around Thrum and Flathead. You can't confiscate him. He's a Kravitzian citizen, Thrum explained, and he's our pilot. You have no authority. 
Oh, yes, we do, the man assured. Then he continued, It is of utmost importance that it wear this emblem at all times to mark it as non-humanoid. He slid a small purple adhesive badge of amorphous shape across the counter to Throne. You want my Kravitzian friend to wear a sticker so people will know he's not humanoid? The Cranian ignored Throne's impertinence. If it is found within three hundred meters of any public works building, it will be immediately disposed of. Is that understood? Disposed of? Yes, disposed of. Is that understood? No, said Throom. I don't understand that at all. Then I suggest you read Grand Ranter Barry's book, The Push for Excellence, Taking Back Our Planet. There is a copy on the word wad I gave you. Push? Throom growled. For excellence? Throom, don't make a scene, Flathead sputtered nervously. It's their planet. Yes, it is, the man said proudly. Now more than ever. So Throom, as you mentioned earlier, is a bit of an outcast from his society. Yeah. He's also the first mate of the Incorrigible, and uh, Flathead is the navigator, and they've, they've worked together. They have uh, history. Do you want to talk about uh, their relationship a little? Yeah, they're, they have one of the closer relationships in the book because they are both what you would call outcasts. They're not only non-typical for their group, they're actually outcast and, and shunned in a lot of ways. Through him because he, he just isn't braggarty. He doesn't throw rocks and uh, crush people. Whereas Flathead, he had, he comes from a very strict caste system, and he chose a career that was outside his caste. And so he was outcast. And um, that brings them both together, and they um, have the closest relationship on the ship. They've been They've known each other for some time. So that's why what happens later in the book is is a little more tragic. And 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 besides them we have just a really wide cast of characters. I don't I don't necessarily want to just go into each one in detail because at times the only thing that we can say about them is is going to be the uh, a spoiler for their arc. Uh, is there anyone I I guess this would be my question are out of the rest of the characters is there anyone who seems kind of a uh, a side or secondary character in this one who you plan on bringing out as a much larger character in the next book? Well, Penny will figure prominently in the next book. As far as having a larger arc somewhere down the line, uh, Hardiger has a possibly a whole book, at least a short story, waiting for him. Okay, and and Penny, being Penny Forethought, um, um, she's, she's one of the uh, the new crew members they pick up. She's a goober, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there are a lot of things to talk about, but I'm I'm worried that talking about them might be be too spoilery. That's the problem. Is, hopefully, to get people, yeah. yeah, a lot of I'm, a lot I'm of things that... happen. Hopefully, a lot of surprises happen in the book, and so I wouldn't want to spoil them. You know, I'll 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 go ahead and I, 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 I'll I'll try to keep this as non-spoilery as possible. My my personal favorite character is is uh, kind of bites the dust very very early on, and uh, I was I was very frustrated about that because uh, I had so much fun with the voice. You're, you're not uh, alone. I, I, he talked about a fish out of water, and I got to like that character too. But the reason he existed was for what happens to him. To happen to him, yeah, and yeah, yeah and it's other people have told me the same thing, but there's yeah. a whole, yeah. whole other planet of them available, I guess. <laughs> yeah, 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 and it, and it was it was it was very obvious from the rest of the book that 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 it it, it was meant to be a uh, 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 really it existed for the arc of a different character. Th that's another thing about this book that that I would say is it, it's a book in which people aren't necessarily safe. You, you know, there's a. I, I think especially in kind of more comedic versions of any genre, you have this feeling of of, of safety. Everybody's going to make it out okay, and that's not necessarily the case here. No, uh, which, which is, is why, why. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Go sorry. ahead. Sorry. No, I, I I couldn't write the book like that because one of the things that I think gives us our in, as we're speaking humanity in the broader sense of the book, just peoplehood is that insecurity. You don't know if you're going to lose the person next to you tomorrow, or you might be the one gone tomorrow, and there's no certainty. And that, 
I think it was Charles Bukowski said that we're all going to die, and that alone should make us love each other, but it doesn't. So that's a that's another central theme in it. I could I couldn't really be true to what I felt if if people were too safe. Yeah, but but in a funny way. Uh, huh? Oh yeah, I, I don't want to make <laughs> this sound too dark, to but bad things happen, <laughs> and sometimes the only thing you can do is laugh. Yeah, it's it's you know um, uh, th- there are a lot of influences I- in this book. You know, I I kept bringing up uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. Uh, people have uh, said they feel tones of Futurama. You know, and and I think in in and uh, Red Dwarf, I thought uh, a, a lot about uh, later as I got into the late, the latter half of the book. Also, I'm I'm kind of reminded of of the show Lex, which is a little obscure, but uh, in a very similar way, it was it was kind of you would at times not know whether to laugh or cry. Uh, it it in, does, in show. yeah, it does try to cover all the bases. It seems Lex does. Yeah, and yeah, that, and that's uh, one. That's another thing I like from material that I'm either watching or reading is um, hopefully the the humor works on several different levels. I have um, just straight puns or sort of the humor that arises from the difficult situations that we've talked about and not knowing how to deal with them to slapstick. I, I, I try to cover all the bases the same way we do when we're doing quick tracks. We try and have a broad range of different types of humor available for, so that you can experience it viscerally, you know, just, just have a good time with it. But also, if you want to spend more time and dig deeper, you're going to see other things in there various types of wordplay, for instance, like you would find on Arrested Development, that uh, you keep looking and you keep seeing more things. So I, I, lo- I love stuff like that, so I'm going to, that's why I included it in the book. Yeah. And it's also not just humor, but all kinds of things. I don't think, I think you can deal with deep themes without, you know, standing up at a podium and making things stuffy. You can still have fun with things. Right, right, definitely. Well, Kevin, I, um, you know, I'm assuming that people, uh, no matter how they get to this, they're going to see it on the YouTube, uh, my YouTube channel in the end. But just in case they don't, how how can people reach you? Well, uh, you can go in Google Plus. I'm Snurk Rabbledauber, which is a talk about a bit character out of the book. That's Snurk, He's one of them. And yeah. uh, he was supposed to show up later, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get him in the next book. Got it. And and obviously uh, writing uh, writing the Quip Tracks. With Quip Tracks. To you eventually. I'm Kevin at Quip um, Tracks. Dot com. Yeah, and and uh, you can go on Amazon and uh, rate and review the book. There's a there's a good one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There should be links below and everything, but the audiobook is available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. I'm all I'm on setting up a blog, unian.com, o o n i a n dot com. I'm having trouble with the DNS. I'm still working with the host. It'll work definitely if you go www.unian.com, but you shouldn't have to do that. Anyway, Makes other way, if you if you don't do it, you get sent to Quip Track. So either way, you're heading my direction. Got it. Sounds good. All right. Well, Kevin, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, uh, thank you. Everyone, have a good day. I uh, do not have a good day. No, I concur. <laughs> I agree. I'll back that up. Have a good day. Goodbye. Goodbye.